My name is Lori Ristino. If you haven't met me yet, I'm the new director of the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems here at ELS. Today, I have a very special honor, and that is to welcome back Professor Campbell Bisland, and um, she's going to be preparing, or not preparing, she's going to be giving, hopefully she's prepared it, a, uh, a talk today. So for those of you who don't know Professor Bisland, she is, an, uh, she actually is a professor here. She's currently an adjunct professor and an LLM candidate at the Food and Agriculture Law Program at the University of Arkansas Law School, where she teaches animal law and legal writing. In her three years at DLS, she taught several courses, including animal law, property law, legal profession, legal methods, and she continues to work with my center. Um, and this summer, she will be here teaching the animal law seminar. Um, her scholarship focuses on animal law, food labeling law, international trade, and the constitutional issues surrounding our complicated relationships with non-human animals. And, um, and I think some of you know that uh, one of the hallmarks of her teaching is her commitment to her students who have done very well in various competitions. So um, we're really, really pleased to have her back today. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Pete. All right. That's great. Well, now let's see. Uh, that's terrific. Don't everybody look at my, my email now. <laughs> Okay, that's not right. <laughs> um, somebody email me the one to see. Now everybody's looking at it, that's not right. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll open this up and we'll be ready to go. There's got to be a better way. So thank you so much, Lori. Where are you now? I'm working for you. Hi. Hey. I know maybe a third to yeah, about a third of the faces here, and that's really exciting because that means a lot of you are first years. Who's a first year or a MELF this year? Okay. Then um, who's a second year? All right. Then hi. I didn't know you last year. Um, uh, this is. Um, I think the most exciting, interesting area of law, animal law, and, and the um, part of animal law that I've, I've been getting into a lot more lately is uh, having to do with um, animals and agriculture. Um, it's, a, it's an obvious next step for me in, in my work in animal law because uh, um, over our almost 10 billion animals a year are slaughtered in the United States and used for food. And the federal protections for uh, federal protections for animals are minimal at best, and um, and we're going to do a very quick review of those. But mostly, I want to talk to you today about how to some things to consider and some questions to ask when you're um, trying to eat locally or sustainably or however you want to um, refer to it, and you also want to eat humanely. And, uh, is that working? Bill, we're good? Okay, thanks. So, um, I guess I, I'll tell you that the story that kind of got me thinking about this was um, down in Arkansas, it's a considerably warmer um, uh, winter. I'm sorry to say that. <clears throat> you can think of me in July when I'm, uh, well, in July I'll be here, so that'll be all the better. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so my, uh, my boyfriend and I were grilling out, and he had gone to a lot of trouble to make me this special veggie burger, which I thought was a little unusual. He's, he's considerate, but he's not that considerate. And then he pulls out this, uh, this like, wrapped, just like this, like it could be in a Ziploc bag, just this piece of meat. I said, Brad, where would you get that? Uh, oh, I got it. It's local. This is local. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, I bought it at the... Um, you know that road, that country road, you know, Highway 2 that goes by that old chicken coop, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like there was a sign on the side of the road, local grass-fed beef. And I, I said, do you know who slaughtered it? Do you know, I mean, who is this, where, how, did you buy it or did they give it to you? I bought it. Well, so it had absolutely nothing on it. It was just a plastic wrap meat. And I thought, I understand where it's coming from. I think that's it's admirable to want to eat locally, and I, you know, I try to do that as well, but there are other things to think about. Um, not the least of which is, how was the animal handled, and then how was the meat handled, and who handled it, and all of that. Anyway, so 
What I want to do is um, just a, a <laughs> this is what I'd like to think the sign was the bat that Brad had seen, local game, but I'm thinking it probably looks something more like that. <laughs> so what I want to do is a, a very quick review of what the federal law says about animals and agriculture. Um, and I'm going to uh, split, kind of compartmentalize animal welfare laws into three separate topics. One is confinement, just how they're raised. Second, transportation. And third, slaughter. Um, this morning before I left the house, I looked in the mirror and I, I said, I am wearing black and gray and I will talk about slaughter all day. <laughs> it's kind of what I'm, what I'm thinking and writing about a lot lately is slaughter. I, it's kind of perverse. I don't know why. But that's where things get really interesting, I think, in, in local agriculture. Um, then, I, then I want to I move on to talk about some animal welfare issues that are specific to local agriculture or eating locally or raising your own animals for that matter. And then finally, just a couple questions that maybe you might want to ask or some things that maybe you had thought about it in terms of how to, uh, how to address animal, um, the treatment of animals in uh, global agriculture. Okay? So that's uh, our agenda. So um, as far as uh, federal animal welfare law, like I said, I'm going to split this into three separate topics. Federal law that has to do with the confinement of animals. Okay, so that's nothing. We'll move on. Federal law that has to do, and I'm not being flipped, I am being flipped, um, but I'm also being honest. There is absolutely no federal law that uh, addresses how animals um, should or should not be confined in farming. Um, that's contrary to, I think, what a lot of Americans believe. Uh, we, we think about, think about our pets. Um, we have a, uh, anybody who's got a dog or a cat or really any kind of domestic animal um, probably knows that there are uh, some pretty comprehensive laws in the books, mostly state-based, that have to do with what you can and cannot do to your pet or what you must do for your pet. Um, I am not saying that they're all strictly enforced or that I even think that they're enough, but they're considerable, especially when compared to what we have for the protection of other species of animals that are arguably much brighter than my dog. And I, and I love my dog, but you know, I think probably the pigs are brighter than my dog. Um, <laughs> but there's this federal law that has to do with transportation called the 28-hour law. You may have heard about it. Um, it's been around since um, before the turn of the 20th century, and um, it only began to apply to trucks as opposed to just trains back in 2006, I believe. This is called the 28-hour law. It just basically says that um, uh, animals may be transported for 28 or possibly 36 hours at a time uh, without being um, stopped and fed and watered and given an opportunity to rest. Uh, to my knowledge, this hasn't been used um, or enforced against anybody since the late 1940s. So then there's slaughter. And those of you, and I know a number of you worked on the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act case last year, the National Meat Association v. Harris. I think you did as well. And Jen, yeah, so you're, you know probably a great deal more about the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act than you'd ever like to. This is a federal law that um, was enacted in 1958. Um, if you are at all interested in slaughter laws, there's a great article by a guy named Jeff Welty, W-E-L-T-Y. He's down at Duke University in their animal law clinic. And he wrote a, an article, I think it's just called Humane Slaughter Laws or Animal Slaughter Laws, something like that. Um, and it really breaks down all the different types of, of slaughter laws. And it gives a very interesting background to how this federal law was enacted. Um, I'll just say that congressmen actually went to a slaughterhouse and viewed the killing floor and what, what, it was, what went on in a typical livestock slaughterhouse and then put in motion um, an act that has essentially two components to it. One is says that a livestock animal must be, quote, rendered insensible, which basically means stunned so that they become unconscious before they're slaughtered. Um, and second is that, uh, is that it also, also authorizes the USDA to create regulations that manage or that deal with 
how animals are managed in connection with slaughter. And so that's what happens between the time the truck pulls up to the slaughterhouse, the, the livestock gets out, and is moved either to a holding pen or to the, um, the queue to the, um, what they call the killing floor. And so um, this exists. Uh, and it's a whole separate talk that I gave this weekend, but um, it is problematic because it's not very well enforced. And because right now, it, according to the Supreme Court, it preempts any state efforts to create higher standards of welfare for animals in interstate um, commercial slaughterhouses. We'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so slaughterhouses, um, for the most part, are all federally inspected. If you raise and slaughter animals for meat, and this and now I'm talking about not just livestock, cattle, hogs, um, sheep, goats, uh, it's also poultry. Um, if, if you are going to raise and slaughter animals and sell that meat, you have to have you have to either comply with um, uh, federal meat inspection guidelines or poultry products inspection guidelines as set forth by federal law here. Um, if you uh, state a, a slaughterhouse within a state um, that deals that deals in interstate commerce will have to have at least one USDA Food Safety Inspection Act, FIS, FSIS, sorry, Food Safety Inspection Inspector, FSIS Inspector on site at all times um, to monitor how uh, the animals are handled and how the meat is handled, but almost exclusively how the meat is handled. This is all about food safety, and that's what these, like, just, uh, this is a very quick kind of like, these are the laws. So federally inspected slaughterhouses, there are about 800 nationwide right now, but that number drops every single year. Uh, about 147 plus million livestock um, are slaughtered in, in these plants each year. Uh, but only a, a small handful of these 800 or so plants uh, are responsible for slaughtering 55% of all um, animals, less livestock and poultry, that are consumed for food. So that's, so the, the market is highly centralized. Um, and so when I say cattle 98%, hogs 99%, that means 99% of the hogs that are slaughtered for food in the United States each year are slaughtered at a, uh, a, a federally inspected plant. Now, let's move on. States. What do states do for confinement? They've moved a little farther along. Um, California is, the, is sort of the poster child for all things animal welfare, really. Um, but the California, Oregon, Florida, a number of other states have begun to enact laws that deal with very specific types of confinement in industrial agricultural settings. Gestation crates for hogs, battery cage, cages for um, egg-laying hens, um, veal crates for veal calves. Trying to phase out what um, animal welfare uh, uh, advocates believe are the most confining, the least humane methods of raising animals. And so at the state level, there are some states that are trying to move in this direction. Uh, California, in, in 2008, um, California voters, by a margin, 63% of the voters, approved of Prop 2, um, which was actually more, more California voters approved of Prop 2 than, than approved of Obama, which I thought was sort of a remarkable uh, statistic um, in bad and good ways. Uh, and uh, that um, they enacted uh, the farm, farm Animal Cruelty Prevention Act that led to um, the first law enacted a year later that you may have heard about, which is that California is going to be phasing out battery cages for, these are very small cages, for um, chickens that lay eggs. It's, you've probably seen somebody say it's like the size of a piece of paper, this, this cage, and maybe a couple chickens will be in it. Um, California is phasing that out. Uh, in the next few years, there will be all sorts of legal battles and lots of dormant commerce clause challenges. You've done, you've done dormant commerce clause, all right? In, in con law, it's useful. So, um, so states are starting to 
uh, address confinement. Now, states, now we're getting, let's get a little bit more local. If a, if a state um, slaughterhouse only sells their meat locally, that is inter, intrastate, not interstate, that slaughterhouse um, may be still federally inspected or it may be state inspected, which means it's under a state inspection program, a set of state laws. Uh, uh, under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, states can create their own set of regulations. It's just that those regulations must be equal to or greater than the regulations under um, <coughs> Federal Meat Inspection Program. So essentially, there's really no difference. Even though there's this, you know, on the books it says there's state and there's federal, um, the regulations are supposed to be the same. So state inspected slaughterhouses are supposed to comply with the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. Some states have their own Humane Methods of Slaughter Act that is exactly the same. A handful have uh, uh, Humane Slaughter Acts that are uh, slightly more, um, I should say, uh, provide greater protections or higher standards of welfare. Incidentally, National Meat Association calls into question whether that's still constitutional, but that's a whole other conversation. So, um, state inspection, or sorry, state slaughterhouses, remember I said there were about 800 or so federally inspected slaughterhouses? There were about 1,900 state inspected slaughterhouses. And that seems like a lot, but they, they actually slaughter far few fewer animals than um, at the federal level. So these are small companies. These are small plants. Um, and in Vermont, there are, the last count I've seen is 12 commercially licensed uh, livestock and poultry slaughterhouses in Vermont. So let's talk about eating local. How do you bring eating local together with eating humanely? And I want to talk about two different uh, types of eating local. I'm going to do it in opposite order, actually, and do purchasing locally raised first. So you go to the store, or you go to the farmer's market, or you're a member of a CSA, or something like that, and you're getting meat raised locally. You've probably all seen it somewhere, right? You, you know, at a farmer's market, or um, probably, I assume, the co-op here carries some locally raised meat, right? Yep. You've seen it? Okay. So, um, the USDA has recognized that this type of meat is very much on, you know, in demand, much more so than, than in the past. Uh, the latest, I don't think, is the 2012 census out for agriculture? Is that out yet, do you know? They're asking for people to respond to it, yeah. They're asking people to respond to the 2012? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, the, by the, according to the 2007 census, um, direct to consumer marketing, which is that far farmer's market or CSA, that type of, of marketing, um, was a $1.2 billion business, uh, but it was up from $551 million from 10 years previous. We expect it to be much greater once the, this next census comes out. Um, so, Misty Knoll Farms, does anybody know these people? Are they friends of yours? I promise, because I'm going to feel really bad and be like, that's my aunt. <laughs> but, um, so, remember I said I wanted to talk about three different things, confinement, transportation, and slaughter. So I was looking at, um, online, just, just looking into different um, local <coughs> meat providers in Vermont and came across Misty Knoll. They are by far the largest poultry producer in Vermont. Uh, they sell, you know, broiler chickens for the most part. These aren't these aren't for eggs. This is um, chicken meat, and uh, they s slaughter somewhere around a quarter million chicken annually. Um, the next largest is so much so it's it's kind of funny. The statistic I found was they the, the next largest slaughters between two and sixteen thousand chickens annually, and I thought that seems like a really broad range to not know which one, <laughs> either, I don't know which one didn't know. But, um, and all the rest of them in, in Vermont slaughter less than, less than 2,000 annually. And so we're talking about um, a large producer in Vermont that has uh, barns of, that house tens of thousands of chickens, 
They sell to UVM, Champlain College, Middlebury. Um, they're quite a, a large business. Now, they're wet, looking at their website. Free range turkeys and chickens, naturally raised poultry. What does free range mean? Anybody want to take a stab at it? They have access to outdoors. Just access. They have access to outdoors, right? There's a door that's open, and if they want to go outside, they can. Right? They're not in cages. And really, that access to outdoors is very climate specific, right? So that access to outdoors will really only apply when it's warm enough for them to be outside. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be outside. They are free to go outside if they should so choose, is in theory what free range means. What does naturally raise mean? Nothing? Right. It means nothing. <laughs> Legally. Um, although that's starting to change a little bit in the courts. Um, it really doesn't promise you anything all that much. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean organic. Um, we're so cynical, aren't we? It's only going to get worse from here <laughs> for you. Uh, but that's okay, then you'll join me. So um, at this 412 acre farm um, that sells really about three quarters of its, of its chicken products here in Vermont, so this is a local business, local farm, local food. Um, <coughs> They essentially have a factory farm for chickens. Um, and the, the interviewer that I, I read this interview where this uh, person was interviewing, she, she was able, she wasn't allowed to look into any of the uh, warehouses or the you know, large, um, I don't want to call them barns because that conjures up sort of this like old McDonald's barn uh, picture, but you know, these large kind of warehouses of chickens. She wasn't allowed to go into one that actually had chickens in it, but she looked at a one that was preparing to receive more chickens. Um, and she noticed that it looked kind of small, and she asked the uh, owner if, if perhaps um, the chickens might enjoy a little more room. And his response was, well, I haven't asked them. Ah. And um, that, you know, I think really, he realized as soon as he said that, that that didn't go over very well, because then immediately he got serious and said, well, in my opinion, they have all the room that they need. Right? And, well, who knows? How does anybody know how much room a chicken needs? I actually had a professor once say to me, not here, but in Arkansas, he was a visiting professor, exactly, almost exactly the same thing. Well, nobody's really ever asked a chicken what they really want. So who are we to presume? Which I think is just absurd, so I'm not even going to continue to address it. But so I think that you know, this is a, a perfect example of a you know, as stewards of Vermont's working landscape, we treat our farm as a precious, irreplaceable resource. Awesome. The chickens range free in spacious, specially designed enclosures. Um, literally true. Does it mean what you think it means when, some, when, when somebody who isn't as cynical as you are now as lawyers? Would they understand it that way? Probably not. So, um, you know, so that's confinement. As far as, um, as transportation, I don't think that's as much of a, an issue for just state raised uh, animals, especially in this state, but I will tell you this, that um, it's not uncommon to uh, have local meat actually be shipped fairly far away, I should say, local animals shipped fairly far away to be slaughtered, processed, turned into meat products, and shipped back to be sold locally again. So, um, and you're not in your head, you, you've probably heard of this happening. So, so that's a perfect example of you thinking, you doing the right thing, spending a boatload of money on something that, um, that you think is local, that you think is sustainable, and yet what you don't know is that that animal traveled a great distance uh, and, and dealt with a great deal of stress as a result. And you know, not to mention the fact that now we've got you know, the fossil fuels that were burned and um, the processing that went into um, the creation of the meat. So, something to think about. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, I, uh, Craig Pease is in here, right? Okay, good. So, um, I, because I want to talk to him about this, but I don't want to do it in front of everybody. But, um, I'm really curious about this whole trend towards, or this, this trend of uh, raising chickens and buying fresh eggs. And, look, I love it. I, I think it's really great. But um, egg, you know, chickens live. Chickens will live a fairly long time if you let them and take care of them. 
But they only lay eggs for what? Two, maybe three years. So I think there's a, an animal welfare issue involved in this whole everybody raising chickens for eggs. What happens when they stop laying eggs? I'm trying to convince a local farmer that his chickens are paying it forward by um, giving him more than he's giving them right now so that it's like paying into their retirement. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but I'm working on it. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny to me how often people uh, who actually raise their own chickens um, decide they're just going to let you know, nature take its course, quote unquote, like just let them loose into the woods to be, you know, to be dinner for a raccoon or a fox or what, or a hawk, what have you. Um, I don't think that's right. Say what you will. Um, so now let's talk about local slaughter. Um, there are, I think, I think as far as eating locally, the biggest problem is when eating locally, eating animals, the biggest problem is a lack of slaughterhouses. Up until just a few years ago, the number of small slaughterhouses, and again, when I say small slaughterhouses, I mean state-based that, you know, that, that slaughter only you know, relatively few animals, not like the large industrial-sized ones, uh, they've been on the decline. And that's, it's just been a, 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 as a result of market concentration, just like the number of um, you know, dairy farmers has been on the decline in Vermont. Uh, so that has meant that anybody that gets into the business today of raising animals for food have a really difficult time finding somebody to slaughter. Remember, if you're going to sell the meat, it has, to, it has to be slaughtered at a slaughterhouse that complies with federal or state same kind of guidelines. It has to be inspected. And, and this is not a, a, that's not an inexpensive business to run. So now it's gotten to the point where some farmers that are raising, that are doing their, you know, their best to raise sheep or goats or, or what have you to sell, or, or, you know, to sell as meat, are sometimes having to try and find a slaughterhouse, like make reservations to slaughter their animals before they're even born. And when you think about it, um, it all kind of happens at the same time. Most of the slaughter takes place in the fall. So um, it's, it's very hard for, um, for local farmers to find slaughterhouses. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's uh, either you have to put your animals on a truck and drive hours away to find a place that will slaughter them, or you may be, um, you may be forced to do business with a slaughterhouse that you're not particularly happy with, but what are you going to do? You can't afford to keep feeding the animals you have. I mean, this is a, a very tight profit margin for these farmers. So um, the, you know, the, the problem of the lack of, of smaller, small-scale slaughterhouses, it's not unique to Vermont, but it's definitely a big problem here. Uh, does anybody live in Randolph? Nobody lives in Randolph. There is, there's a, a place in Randolph called, um, oh, what's it called? Something. It's like Brothers Butchers or something like that. But it's a fairly new place and it's um, animal welfare certified. But there was a, there, apparently up until about, I guess in 2006, two of the fairly local slaughterhouses burned down within six months of each other. One, one was in Randolph, and the other one was in upstate New York, I believe. Did they, did they have any idea what happened? There was accusations of arson at the time, but I don't think they ever tracked it down. Very curious, right? So who knows, and I just started a rumor right now. But, um, <laughs> right, oh no, the, actually it was, it was in Rutland, and the other one was in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, which is just like upstate New York, so it's really the same thing. Um, interesting story about that one in, Rut in, uh, in Massachusetts. Apparently, there was a steer there uh, in the, actually in the packing plant slaughterhouse that was awaiting slaughter and was shooed out while the, you know, to keep the steer from burning, and he escaped and he was never seen again, which I think is kind of cool. So he's out there somewhere, um, I like to think, anyway. So, in Vermont, uh, 
local state government has had a really hard time trying to deal with this problem. Right? It, it wants to support local farming. It wants to support sustainable eating. We're dealing with the fact that we, have, we don't have enough slaughterhouses. Um, on top of that, in 2009, there was this horrific story of the Bushway veal calf slaughter plant. Anybody remember this? That's, so, um, when dairy cow, this is a big dairy state, when, uh, in order for dairy cows to give milk, they have to lactate, which means they have to have recently been pregnant. So, on dairy farms, dairy cows are always either pregnant or just having, or just having given birth. And usually what happens is that cycle is kept um, to the point where as the, as the cow is lactating, she's then again impregnated and will be carrying a calf at the same time. It's exhausting business being a dairy cow. Um, just, I can just use my imagination and imagine that. I don't know it personally, but um, I think anybody can imagine that as being a, a difficult life. Um, but a dairy cow will have male calves and, uh, and female. Female calves, no, it's a, what do you call it? Pepper? A baby, a, a, is a, would be a heifer. Thank you. So, so for a, for a uh, dairy farmer, a male calf is like having a, a female child and when you're only allowed to have one child. You know, it's like it's the last thing that you want. Is what is a male calf going to do for you, right? So most male calves from dairy farms in Vermont um, will either go straight to slaughter to be used in um, like bologna, hot dogs, that type of processed meat. Um, they might go out, they might be shipped to a feedlot out west, to a, a veal, um, industrial veal plant where they'll be crated for a few weeks before their slaughter. Um, and, or they might go straight up to the Bushway veal packing plant, which was in, was in the Northeast Kingdom, that slaughtered what, what are called bob calves, B-O-B calves. Those are, those are veal calves that are um, only a couple of days old, and that's supposed to be quite a delicacy. Well, in, in uh, 2009, early 2009, I think, this, this plant opened, a slaughterhouse opened in Grand Isle, and within four months, the USDA had already found animal welfare violations. And then several more violations. Uh, and eventually, as has happened numerous times since then, um, somebody got a job there and videotaped undercover what was going on and how these veal cats were being treated. That was released to the public. You can go online and see it. It's called Bushway, B-U-S-H-W-A-Y. And um, the USDA inspector, who's since been fired, also participated in um, abusing the veal calves. And uh, when I've, I'm not going to show pictures or, or discuss it any further, because that's something you can look up. But um, that plant's been shut down. It actually is a pretty sensational prim, you know, prim law story. But uh, since then, the Vermont legislature has really tried to figure out how to deal with this, because it was a PR nightmare for the state. This is a bucolic farming state. You know, rolling hills, happy cows. Um, that was not good for us. So in, in 2010, um, the Vermont legislature uh, passed a law that, well, they floated the idea of, of having cameras in slaughterhouses, which would have been phenomenal, I think. But uh, that didn't make it out of committee. Um, what they did end up doing was a lot of rhetoric, I think, but they did also form um, an advisory board. Uh, they required every licensed of the 12 commercially licensed slaughterhouses locally to submit plans for how they were going to handle animals humanely, essentially just creating some real, like, we're watching you um, uh, messaging. So along the same lines, the, um, the state is trying to deal with the shortage problem by um, uh, creating, uh, they've, uh, the, the Agency of Agriculture has uh, offered some grants for slaughterhouses to expand, that kind of thing. Um, but it's definitely a problem. 
Uh, I talked with a, a woman who um, raises hogs down in Arkansas, Mason Creek Farms. Beautiful farm, very happy pigs. Um, they, they look like they have terrific lives, but they have to drive six hours to go to slaughter um, because she wants to have them slaughtered at a certified humane slaughtering facility. And there is, I think, one in Arkansas. I think she might even take them um, to Missouri. But uh, it's so, so that's, you know, the problem is everywhere. Another thing that I think is really interesting um, that for, is in a, a law in Vermont is something that was enacted in 2008. And if you're familiar with rural Vermont, that organization, they were instrumental in helping get this passed. That is a law that allows a farmer to sell their, uh, their animals for meat without having to have them slaughtered at a state or federally inspected slaughterhouse. Here's the deal. The Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Poultry Products Inspection Act, those two federal laws I mentioned, have a loophole called custom exempt. And that custom exempt loophole says, if you raise your sheep yourself and you want to slaughter them for food, you can do that either on your own in your backyard or you can take them to another facility that is considered a custom exempt facility that will slaughter them for you so long as the, what they give you back is labeled not for sale and you promise that it's just for household or domestic use. You can serve it to your friends for dinner, but they can't pay you or you can't charge them. You can't sell it. I think this is probably, I'd like to think that this is what Brad bought on the side of the road or it could have just been something that um, the owner himself slaughtered or, or herself, but um, this is custom exempt. And so if, you, so if, if somebody wants to raise uh, meat on their own, they can do so. However, the one and the two are the only custom exempt slaughter facilities in Vermont. The rest of them are custom exempt processing. The difference being one kills the animal, the other dismembers it and turns the, um, the animal into meat products. Right? So, again, very few places, even if you just want to have your animals slaughtered for your own family or friends. Right? So, that means you've got a couple other options. One, you could hire a mobile slaughtering unit. Anybody familiar with those? Yeah? Um, I, when I saw Mark Latham that double ALS in January, and I did this spiel about something, I don't know, something not necessarily about slaughter so much, but about how disgusting so much processed food is, and he came up afterwards and he said, I'm so glad I raised my own meat. You know, and he told me that they hire a, a mobile slaughtering unit. This is somebody who will come to you, to your farm, and slaughter your animals for you. They are considered custom exempt from all those restrictions and, and safety regulations, food safety regulations, under the Federal Meat Inspection Act and Poultry Products Inspection Act. The other option is to go to some sort of black market slaughter facility, and these things are on the rise. Uh, they're a problem in Vermont. They're a problem in, uh, interestingly enough, they're a big problem in Florida. Even in, the, in Hiale, where you guys remember reading the city of, um, wait, hold on, I can do this. Church of Lukumi Babaluai, right? It took me two years to get that right. Um, versus City of Hialeah, yeah, the, the, the um, Hialeah. Hialeah, did I get that? Oh, I see, I can Hialeah. say Lukumi Babaluai, but I can't say Hialeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, yeah, that would make sense, E-A-H. So, uh, in, down there in Florida, there is, they're having a huge problem with these underground, black market, off the grid slaughter facilities where people can take their animals and, um, and have them slaughtered, or they can just uh, buy slaughtered animals that um, are raised there at these, at these farms, and no, there's no inspection, there are no, there's no regulations, so it's completely outside the law. Now, obviously there are food safety issues involved. There are also major animal welfare issues involved, and if you look at the um, Animal Legal Defense Fund site, they are now involved in a public nuisance suit against a couple of these large um, black market slaughtering facilities down in Florida. I mean, they're already violating the criminal law. 
But this lawsuit is a public nuisance suit by, brought by local residents um, that are saying, this is disgusting what you're doing uh, to these animals in, in uh, essentially in our neighborhood or close by. So, uh, Vermont's 2008 law allows consumers to buy, this is how it works, to buy a live animal from somebody, um, let's say you're a farmer and you raise cows, and I want to buy the, the grass-fed beef that you, from the cows that you raise. In Vermont, I can go to you and say, I'd like to buy half of that cow. And you say, no problem, it'll cost you this much, I give you that money, you continue to raise that animal, and then you slaughter the animal when it's time, process, get it processed however, I don't have to deal with it, and you give me the meat. Now, this is clearly in violation of federal law. And the USDA has been threatening Vermont as such for a while, and yet it's still on the books and it's still here, and I imagine at some point either it's going to have to be, um, uh, it'll either be challenged in court or, I mean, who knows, it's just another one of those great Vermont laws, but um, if you want to read more about that, it's, you can go to the ruralvermont.org website. <clears throat> so, I have absolutely no idea why I put this in here, except that I thought it was really funny. Um, that's illegal. Like that, a person who was already in trouble and obviously being scrutinized was doing something illegal. Okay, so, um, don't you just want to know the rest of that story? <laughs> So anyway, um, this is, you know, this sign looks so great. 100% organic, grass-fed. Okay, so the steers are fed 100% organic grass feed. Are, are the, is the meat itself 100% organic? Maybe, maybe not. Sounds really good, but the, the biggest problem when it comes to animal welfare and organic meat is that if the animal does get sick, the farmer can't give the animal antibiotics. Or, if the farmer does give the animal antibiotics, that will no longer be considered organic meat. And I believe it could also threaten their organic licensing altogether. Is that right, Lori? I think so. So, if you, yeah, if you, even just keeping them to the side, I don't think you can do that. So that means, that really puts, I think it puts, uh, even the, the, the most caring farmer in a really bad position. You let an animal suffer or not. So um, that's, you know, I just wanted to mention that as far as, as organic goes. Um, so where are we now? We've got custom exempt. Now let's go to do it yourself. Uh, it is very, very popular to raise your own chickens. It's going to be even more popular to do even, I think this is a trend we're gonna see more of. Um, I don't know if any of you saw Mark Zuckerberg last year, somehow happened to be involved in some, like had a friend who had a farm and slaughtered a pig or a cow or something and thought it was just the coolest thing ever and he made this vow last year that he was not gonna eat any meat unless he personally slaughtered that animal. I can't find any other discussion about that in the media after he made that, that initial vow got tons and tons of press. But I can't find anything later on that follows up that says, yes, uh, I broke my vow, or no, yes, I have continued to slaughter. I mean, it seems like the guy who runs Facebook would be a little busy, but um, this do-it-yourself farming looks so good on its face. And when you think about the way we used to farm, not you and I, but 50, 60, 70 years ago, or even you know, far, long, longer ago, when a lot of people had you know, raised their own animals, and they didn't just raise one type of animal, they had multiple species, and they slaughtered their own animals. They, were, they practiced animal husbandry, because if you take care of your animals, animals take care of you, it was a compact. But, and they slaughtered their own animals, and they knew how to do it, and they weren't regulated. So, why is that a problem today? Um, I think that, you know, the question really, where the law is really, really fuzzy right now, is 
um, is obvious when you all you have to do is Google something like backyard slaughter or slaughter animal cruelty backyard something like that, and you'll find all these news stories of well-meaning people trying to raise their own animals and being um, ineptly trying to slaughter them. Uh, some of them in a you know in such an unreasonable fashion, like taking a hammer to a hog's head, that kind of thing, that, um, you know, that's an obvious animal cruelty issue. Is it against the law? If you raise chickens and you want to slaughter your chicken, and you do a really poor job of it, and it takes a really long time, and the chicken suffers, is that against the law? Should that, is that against the state law, Nikki? What do you think? Uh, I have no idea. Well, that's a good enough answer. <laughs> Remember, the answer is always, it depends. Right, you know. um, I didn't need to put you on the spot. But it does depend, right? And it really depends on, is that state one of the very few states that has an animal cruelty law that doesn't exempt agricultural animals? In almost every state, if you go look at the animal cruelty law, uh, it will, at some point, either in an exemption section or um, you know, somewhere in there, it will say that, that the, uh, the, what is prohibited or required does not apply to either animals raised for food or animals in agriculture, agricultural animals, animals that are regulated by the Department of Agriculture, something like that. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the end of the story. Because often what also is in the law is that it depends whether or not the behavior conforms with traditional agricultural practices, traditional animal husbandry practices. Um, if you, you, know, you can cast your mind back to torts, you know that there's, there's always a sort of question about if, something, if a professional is doing something the way other professionals do it. Is this an accepted agricultural practice? Is slaughtering a hog with a hammer a, an accepted agricultural practice? I think safe, safely we can say no. That's not how it's done, right? So in the case of the California man, who uh, was arrested for animal cruelty because he was, he was um, or as, as his wife said, we didn't do anything wrong, we just didn't know how to kill the hogs. Well-meaning people, not quite putting it all together, that guy is charged with animal cruelty. Now, what if instead of a hammer, he tried to use a machete to slit the, the uh, hog's throat? Animal cruelty? Probably not. Hard to say. And if that's the case, if it's not animal cruelty, that means that he can do to his hog what a federally or state inspected plant can't do to a hog, at least according to the law. Remember? Because under the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, livestock, including hogs and, and cattle, have to be stunned or rendered unconscious before their throats are slit. So that means that if the state's animal cruelty law exempts animals in agriculture, farm animals, and the place that the animal is being slaughtered is exempt from those laws, exempt from the federal, the federal humane laws, that there's no regulation that says how you can or cannot slaughter your own animals. So long as you're somewhat close to accepted agricultural practices. And there are very few places that somebody can go to learn how to slaughter their own animals. You know, if you want to learn a stitch when you're knitting, you can go to YouTube. Well, maybe you don't do that, but I do because I'm a complete dork. But if you want to, if you want to slaughter an animal, there are, I suppose there are places you can go, but it's not something that is, this is something that's like an afterthought to a lot of people who are trying to raise their own animals. So, not to mention the fact that there's now this big backlash uh, with, in some zoned areas, with people saying that they don't want backyard slaughter to be happening in their neighborhood. They don't like that. So there are lots and lots of uh, sort of, there are lots of issues involved with backyard slaughter that a lot of people don't think about. Um, so, I just, I'm going to finish up with a couple of things that you might consider when you're going shopping for locally raised food. Whether it's, it's eggs, cheese, uh, meat, poultry, anything like that. This is a third party 
certification system that um, animal welfare certified, certified humane, is from the Animal Welfare Institute. And uh, they are, they as a third party certification system, actually do a pretty decent job of um, physically inspecting how um, the animals are treated from birth through slaughter. They will go and visit the slaughterhouse if there is a slaughterhouse, if, if that's what we're talking about, the creation of meat. And um, they inspect annually. Apparently, it's, uh, at least from the people that I've discussed it with, it's not an easy thing to become certified humane. Again, it's third party, which means I, I think you never really know, unless you've done a lot of research, and, you know, that, that, what, the, that the, the label that you're looking at is, is legitimate. Um, just like saying something's naturally raised, you should be skeptical when you see something like this. Um, but, so when you buy, say, some mutton at the farmer's market or something like that, don't just take it at face value that the fact that they were raised in these beautiful surroundings tells the whole story. Ask them, <clears throat> where are they slaughtered? You know, did they have to travel very far? Uh, is the slaughterhouse certified humane? Um, are they certified humane? That kind of thing. Uh, think about the location, the, the season for being able to go outside and be outside and graze or, or be, you know, in a barnyard is obviously much shorter here than it is in other parts of the country. So that might be something to consider. Perhaps it makes more sense and it would be more humane to uh, buy um, locally raised humane meat from somewhere that's not actually local. So it, you know, it just means that they're I'm basically just suggesting that there's more to the question than just uh, you know, whether or not it was raised, the animal was raised down the road. Oh, in Randolph, it's called the Royal Butcher. They're AWA certified, and apparently they're quite good um, as far as these things go. And then I'm going to leave you with this last thought. I, thought of, I think this is a really sort of non-intuitive creative idea. So I mentioned that dairy farmers, it's a terrible thing when their cow has a male calf, right? Completely useless. They've wasted a, they've wasted a calf. Um, they, could have, they could have been a girl. There could have been a heifer that um, could be now a dairy cow. Some, a couple of dairy farmers in Vermont, including uh, one called Jersey Girls Dairy in Chester, and another one called Apple Cheek Farm in Hyde Park, have created a side business to their dairy where instead of immediately selling their calves, they are raising them on their own, at, allowing them to graze outside, you know, be with their mother for a while, then, then allowing them to graze outside and drink they're no longer drinking their mother's milk, but they're drinking milk that the, that the dairy considers substandard for human consumption. So it's not ideal, but it's better, right? I'm all about incremental improvements in animal welfare. So um, what these dairy farmers are doing is trying to create an alternative business. They are raising veal calves, but they're doing it in a humane way. The challenge that they have as farmers is convincing the people who buy the, the meat that comes from these calves, that it's okay that it's pink and not white, right? You, in order for veal to be white and as tender as, as I think, you know, sort of our standard is for the delicacy of veal these days, it means that um, it's so little muscle development that, um, that that is impossible if you're going to try and raise a veal calf humanely. So assuming consumers can change their minds about this and agree, okay, this is, this is veal that is uh, better than industrially raised veal. This actually provides a really uh, valuable new way of, I think they get something like $300, $400 a calf when they sell, uh, when these dairy farms sell them to, uh, processing plants that then go, they go to New York restaurants and other high-end customers. Now, that's sort of, to me, that's a completely non-intuitive idea because I think of veal as, that's always been like the enemy meat, right? Like no matter what, like, oh, you just don't eat veal, right? Or lobster, right? Those two things. Um, but in this case, it's a fact of life that there are going to be male calves born. And I think this is a, this is a, a, a 
positive alternative to the way dairy farmers deal with them today. So, um, you know, if you're going to get locally raised dairy, I suggest Jersey Girls Dairy or Apple Cheek Farm, something like that, uh, because I, I like what they're doing. So, with that, I'll just stop and ask if, if there are any questions. And, and if you think of a question later, please, please feel free to email me because I'd love to hear from you. So, anybody want to talk about slaughter some more? Okay, Kelly. Well, I'll just make a comment. I actually have been to Jersey Girls Farm, and I, and I spoke with, I believe it was the, the oldest member of the family, um, woman, and I had the same reaction when she was talking to me about veal. I was like, oh, you know, like, mm. but I realized um, it's an economic thing. I mean, they have to feed these calves, and everything, every dime they spend on the feed, they have to earn back some somehow, you know, there's an economic factor to everything that they do. Um, and so along those same, those same lines, um, when you're mentioning that if it's meat that's raised locally, but it's being shipped far away and then returning, you are looking at the in environmental impact of sending them off and having them return. That is an environmental impact. But at the same time, that locally raised meat is so vital to the economics of the small farmer. You know, the same farmer that's raising the vegetables likely might not be able to survive on the vegetables alone. So I, I see that there's a higher environmental impact, but at the same time, you have to take into consideration well, what is the economics of it? How is it? How is this affecting, you know, do I still want to pay the money and support that farmer regardless? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and I, I should have kind of finished connecting the dots, which is to say that I support the, the, the uh, expansion or, or the um, governmental support of more uh, humane slaughter facilities in Vermont, which again to me seems like, you know, at first it seems like a non-intuitive thing, right, that I would, that I would want that, right, but, uh, but it makes sense. Because not only does it help the farmers who are trying to do, trying to raise animals responsibly and ethically, um, but it, it prevents animals from having to be shipped over long distances, which is very stressful and, and sometimes harmful, right? So good point. Thank you. Yeah. The mobile slaughterhouse was kind of a ban or whatever in Vermont. My understanding was that was subsidized by the state to some degree. If so, why wasn't that a state? Inspected facility. Would that be possible? Um, if it's cut, if it, if it's if the I wasn't aware of that, but that's good to know. Um, if it's only serving a custom exempt use, then it wouldn't need to be, right? So if it's just going to somebody's farm for you know, slaughtering for their meat for their own meat. Um, now I don't know how much they cost. Uh, I suppose that if if they were going to be used for um, uh, to slaughter animals that would be sold as meat, they would have to be a, a inspe state inspected or federal ins state inspected in Vermont because we have a state inspection program. And I, I expect the difference there is the initial or the ongoing cost that would be much more expensive to have okay. a state inspected facility. Yeah, I wonder. Um, I wonder if you can make a state inspected facility mobile, like if if you just if, if it's physically possible. Do you know anything about that, or are you going to ask something different? No, I'm going to uh, touch on why mobile slaughterhouses in Vermont can come to farmers and process birds, and Great. you can then sell it to retailer, which is PL9492, which is the federal exemption for processing poultry on farm up to 1,000, and then 10,000 birds are two limits. And, you know, that's... So it doesn't have to be state inspected. It doesn't have to be state inspected. That's poultry, and you're absolutely right. I didn't mention that, and I apologize, that, that the Poultry Products Inspection Act is, is far less stringent than the the Meat Inspection Act. So if it is less than, fewer than 1,000 birds, you can do that. Or 10,000. 10,000. There's two. There's two okay. different tiers. Oh, thank you. There's three tiers. There's below 1,000, and then there's 1,000 to 20,000. Yeah. Yeah.
which is such a strange area, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I just have this question. With, with locally slaughtered meat or chicken, what's the incidence of, like, I guess it would be food-borne illnesses? Is that, what it's called? Is that the technical word for it, right? Where, in other words, how dangerous? So I'm just thinking about that burger that, you know, where I picked up from the side of the road. Like, how dangerous? Because I think the general consumer, myself included, feels like that's often like not a good idea to buy food right from the source because of the lack of standards you worry about some sort of illness. But I don't have that. I have no idea. It's factual. Yeah. So um, it's actually important that it was a steak. And not because I think, not that I'm trying to brag about, brag, but that um, that if it's a steak, if you think about like, um, you know, if this is a steak, this surface area here is all the area that could be contaminated with with pathogens, airborne pathogens, right? Or you know, or you know, any sort of contaminant. Right. And so, you, but when you and when you cook a steak, right, the surface area is the part that gets cooked the most, right? So that's safer. But if it were a burger, which is ground beef, which then comes from, you know, who knows how many different cows, that's, that actually can be even more dangerous because you've got um, you know, a burger created from uh, beef that comes from a lot of different uh, cows, a lot of different potential but is that more, of contamination. Is that more dangerous? I'm just curious, like, is it more dangerous or is there a higher risk of, of foodborne illnesses? From locally um, south, you know, sort of slaughtered animals, or is it fact it's just as if not more risky to buy something in a grocery store? I don't know the statistics. It's a really, I mean, it's a good, it's such a good question because food safety experts on either side of the fence will say that it's a myth that locally raised food is always safer, right? So um, it really depends on on the where it's being slaughtered and how it's being slaughtered and all of that. Um, so, you know, I sort of just like, I want to say it was probably less risky, but that's a, a, a guess based on anecdotal. I thought that when they, um, when the federal government inspects poultry, that it's just a visual. They don't, they don't check for pathogens, so right. it's, but often people think they actually do, so you're really not getting a, a you know, a pass on the actual safety of the food. I mean, they're just, because it's ridiculous. You can't tell anything from looking at it. But I think the industry lobbied FSIS against actually testing because, you know, they did. That's right, they that was so. proposed, and um, in fact, some, is it Costco? I think it's Costco, which is so weird, because you don't wouldn't think of a big box store as doing Costco, is, uh, they have become one of the store, what, you know, one of the forces in the movement to insist on um, doing some sort of sampling testing of both produce and, and meat um, to verify that it's not contaminated, or at least you know, provide some assurances that it's not contaminated. But you're right, visual inspection is, is what it is, which is why there are all these regulations about how meat can and should be handled and how the animals can and should be slaughtered, that kind of thing. So through this lecture, we were listening to the merits and the pitfalls of various practices, both local and otherwise. Um, and there was a big theme of humane throughout the whole thing. If somebody just came to you and said, Pamela Beslin, I really care. What's the, huma like the most humane way I can eat? What would your suggestion be? I, well, you, I mean, vegan, of course. You know, and, and I mean, and, and that's a, did I get did I answer the way I was supposed to? Answer? <laughs> it's just, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. 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 you know, it's kind I of funny. I was wondering why it wasn't mentioned. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I mean, you know, it's funny because just on on Saturday I was at um, I was in Portland, Maine, and Maine Law Review had a, a food law symposium, and at the end of the day, this guy got up and he talked all about global warming and agriculture and the future, you know, how the, the collision course and the, like how the more wealthy a nation gets, the more calories they consume, the more protein they consume, the how, how um, intensive, you know, energy intensive the production of all these proteins are and how it's this collision course, it's all going to go to hell, right? And at no point in his lecture did he say, really, we need to eat less meat. You know, and, and I was just waiting for it, waiting for it, and it's something we're not, it's like we're not there yet as, as, a, as a society yet, which is too bad, but you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the most humane. 
And yet, I think that I still think it's important to 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 discuss um, again the incremental ways that we can be more humane, um, because none of us is perfect, and none of us is going to, you know. I think you can't. Uh, I think this is something I heard Cory Booker say once, who's my personal hero, that, that you can't let the fact that you can't solve all the problems prevent you from trying to solve some of them. Or, you know, it's... Absolutely, so and I appreciate but I, that. But I like thank you. being raised as a viable option, at least. <laughs> oh, not only is it viable, but it's, you know, by far the healthiest way to be, um, assuming, you, assuming you take some care, right? My freshman year in college, I decided to go vegetarian, and I ate nothing but grilled cheese sandwiches and chocolate for six months. I gained 20 pounds. I was so miserable. I looked awful. And that really wasn't a very good solution. <laughs> so you have to work at it, right? Yeah. If vegan is the most humane way to eat, um, then what, is, what, is that, what does that do for the farmer? I mean, as a former farmer, radically sustainable in every way possible, you have to use animal byproducts to fertilize the soil. You know, you need the manure, you need the bone meal, the blood meal. Those are the most sustainable ways to make vegetables. So, and then the economics of it is that it's very, very hard to make a living off of selling vegetables alone. So, morally, I see that eating vegan is the most humane way. But when it comes down to what's the reality for the farmer that needs the animals, I mean, how do we support that farmer raising the animals the ethically humane way to support the vegetable farming? So it's it's cyclical, and that's something I really I just I don't know how to do it. It's your eating. Yeah, and I'm sorry I don't I don't either. I don't, but I'm really glad that you raised you know that you both raised those points because this is important. This is the maddening thing about law school, right? It's like nobody's going to give you the answers. We're just going to um, make you more frustrated with more questions to ask yourselves. You got another, you got another question, right? Yeah. So just to tag on to the nuance of ethical eating, I think it's also important to consider um, the difficulties in making just stark sort of contrast between eating meat and eating vegan, because as you sort of explicated in your comment about eating chocolate and grilled cheese. I mean, there's a whole host of ethical issues that come up with just chocolate consumption. Oh my god, I think we need to about that. <laughs> Like, there's, you know, there's a vast difference between some, someone eating Hershey bars and Boca burgers versus someone raising their own food but not necessarily having a quote-unquote vegan diet. Right. I think there's so much nuance, like, claiming those labels and necessarily, like, positing them as the most ethical choice is really problematic. Exactly. It doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> And just coming back to backyard processed poultry, and the only we all enjoy salads in a tiny farmer from Virginia. They tried to shut them down for processing birds in an open air facility because they said it wasn't sanitary. When the lawsuit happened, the university came to swap his chicken, which is processed open air and you know water boiling, all that natural sunlight, good stuff, and it uh, tested ten times less bacteria than the supermarket that they found in the supermarket. And this is from the NIH, National Institute of Health. Oh. Um, so he, he publishes that in his book, but I mean, it's not published. It's a commentary on what happened in the case. So it's not right. a scientific study, but it's you know a third party reporting on this. So it's not just in his book. So I, I mean, it, food safety isn't about you know how many chlorine baths you put your chickens through. It still comes out with 10 times the amount of bacteria as right? processing a pasture-raised bird in your you know, backyard. Right, exactly. Yeah, because if you have to, if you have to irradiate it and bathe in chlorine and do all these other things to it in order to be and you're still getting more unsafe, yeah. right? Yeah, there's something wrong with the system. And, and what about like prion, like mad cow, right? I mean, mad cow mostly comes from processing facilities, right? Yeah. Yeah. If the animals raise correctly, compared to the meat, and has good diet, or what's the actual meat in the animal? Drastically, drastically. Right. They think that, that BSE is transmitted from one cow to another through the animal feed, that if cows are rendered into the feed, so that, that's how um, cows will contract. And, that's, and that is actually against the law in the United States now. Um, but you can feed chickens rendered cows, and you can feed cows rendered chickens. So it all still kind of depends. <laughs> but, and with that, right, we're <laughs> 25 <laughs> Thank you so much.